I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter, finally, about this spy balloon controversy and what it really means for our intelligence and Chinese intelligence, we have with us Dr. Jim Lewis, a senior vice president at CSIS. Jim, I got to ask you, we know that this was a Chinese spy balloon, but why were we so confused about it initially? Well, I think we ought to call this the Roswell episode because most of the UFO sightings people see are balloons, weather balloons, hobbyist balloons, not all, but most. And so the Chinese decided to do a throwback to the 19th century and float a balloon over. That says more about their capabilities because a balloon goes where the wind takes it. And it's not that good as a collection device. So if you're desperate, use a balloon. Otherwise, what it says about us is we've been asleep at the switch for a long time when it comes to Chinese espionage. We're finally waking up. That's good. We started waking up in 2015. Then there was the interregnum. But we need to think of a more comprehensive response to what is a comprehensive Chinese intelligence campaign directed against the U.S. Balloons are only a tiny part. So wait a minute. Why were we asleep at the wheel? And then why did we finally wake up in 2015? Because... Everyone thought China was on a path to become a market democracy. Also, it's a big market and people like selling stuff there. And so if you talk to companies, they would say, it's the price of doing business. Yeah, we know they're trying to steal IP. We try and limit the losses, but it's the pr- it's worth it to get in the China market. And the government kind of went along with that. This is both Republican and Democrats. In 2015, It was the seventh and final of a giant Chinese hack against the Office of Personnel Management. Right, the OPM hack. Where they took the records of anyone who was unfortunate enough to have their clearances held by uh, DOD or associated agencies. They didn't get all the clearances, but they got a lot. And that made President Obama angry. And that's when we started to change course. So we had mostly been monitoring their cyber activities, watching them but letting some of it go because we wanted to do business there. If you were Chinese, you would say, why are you guys complaining? You do this to us all the time. And it's true. We have satellites fly over China in international space every day. We have airplanes go up and down the coast and collect electronic signals. There's probably other stuff we do as well. Cyber, human, undersea. We have a giant campaign against China. And the Chinese say, well, how can you complain? We're just doing what you're doing. And there's some truth to that. I mean, balloons are a bit cheesy. You know, I I still think if they had the courtesy to like paint Winnie the Pooh on the side, it would have been better. But that would have been a nice balloon. That would have, you know, they have no sense of humor over there. Well, neither do we when it comes to this. We uh, panicked and ran around uh, like crazed balloon enthusiasts for a long time. (laughs) Let me get this straight. You're not going to shoot the balloon down over Montana because it might hit one of the three people who live there. No, come on. So there are a lot of unanswered questions. And the guy who suffered the most is the head of China's weather office, China's chief meteorologist, because he was fired. And I assume he was a human sacrifice to help build the Chinese cover story. But as far as I can tell, that's the person who suffered the most from the balloon. So... The balloon was in Montana, and we do have assets there, So, or, or it's presumed that we have assets there. Oh, no, we have assets there. The problem is they're fixed. They're missile bases. And a fixed asset does not move very quickly, if at all. So the idea that you need to have a balloon that might go over it, that depends on the day, depends on the weather, depends on the balloon's mood, um, it's just a crummy technique. What a balloon can do is it can get low enough to collect electronic signals. Explain that. What are electronic signals intelligence? Your your cell phone is a radio. Yeah. And so your cell phone emits a signal. And it's difficult to collect from far away. You can try this yourself at home next time you're on an airplane. Uh, Violate FAA rules for a minute and turn your phone on and see if you can make a call. Once you get over a certain altitude, you can't, right? Mm -hmm. So the range for collecting a cell phone signal is relatively short. 
And the Chinese, it appears, can't do it from space. So they use balloons. You can pick up other stuff. You can pick up any uh, mission that comes out. It might be tests. It might be radio signals. It might be radar signatures. But you only use a balloon if you, if you don't have a better technique. So they don't have a better technique than using a Winnie the Pooh balloon? It appears not because there, well, there's a couple of possibilities. They may not have the technological capabilities yet. They're building rapidly. They're outspending us. They're outlaunching us. In terms of satellites. In terms of satellites and in ships and, and almost anything else you want to count. So it could be that they just don't have the capabilities yet. I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult to do this. We've been in the business for 70 years and... It's still hard for us to do some things. They've been in the business maybe 20, 25 years. So the other option is the Chinese are so aggressive and have so much money that they can afford to do these sort of minuscule marginal activities. And I think that's equally plausible. If you're Xi Jinping, you've got lots of money. No one's ever going to say no to you. And you probably said, why not? Why not fly a balloon? Let's see what happens. And they're good for things like Guam or Taiwan maybe the Korean Peninsula, you know, not the United States, but you can see the attraction. How is it possible that they weren't concerned that we would see a balloon with the payload the size of three buses over our airspace in the United States? So I'm doing research now on China's espionage culture, which is they have a self-justifying narrative, you know, the, the century of humiliation. You were mean to us, and so now it's our turn. I keep telling them, it was the British and the French. You can't blame us, but they don't want to hear that. They say, you do it too, so why can't we? Ah, eh, fair point. We've told them in semi-official dialogues that we get every country, every big country spies. And so we get that you spy on us, we spy on you. But what we don't do is steal technology and we'd like you to stop. And they said, first they said no, then they said maybe, and then they said no again. But the other part to this Stealing is, technology both from the government and from private sector. Anybody, any place that's not nailed down. The other part of this, though, is that they are uh, very aggressive, very well-resourced, and relatively successful. So for China, spying on other countries, they don't feel like they're bound by Western law. They feel like it's a construct for the imperialists to maintain domination. So you know what? Um, the norm says don't get caught. They don't really care. The norm says keep it at a level that doesn't bother people. They don't really care. They don't think our rules apply. And so that's part of why this has become so difficult. Well, you know, it's been reported that they've used these types of balloons over the last several years in over 40 countries, not just the United States. But why wouldn't they draw a red line in the United States? Because we're their most important target. We're the ones they care about the most. I'm not sure what 40 countries they actually care about, right? So you can think of maybe ASEAN countries, maybe Northeast Asia. Where else do you really care? The United States, Australia, maybe some of the Pacific Islands. Also, remember, with a balloon, you don't get a choice where it goes. You put it in the air and hope the wind takes it someplace interesting. So I, the 40 countries... Maybe, you know, I mean, what name 40 countries do you think China is interested in enough to fly a balloon over? It might be, it might be Africa. I mean, you might want to collect cell phone signals in Africa. You might want to collect cell phone signals in South America. It's a lot of effort for not a lot of return. And when you say collect cell phone signals, you mean listen to conversations? Yeah, you can do that now. By the way, this is an advertisement. You can do that now on the web using something called Web SDR, Web Software Defined Radio. And so you can, if you type in Web SDR, it gives you access to some cell phone channels. And so people have been using this in the Ukraine because the Russians have the money that they were supposed to spend on secure communications equipment actually went to uh, mansions in Moscow or Switzerland. And so they've been buying cheap Chinese radio equipment, easily collectible. That's not Web SDR, but we know people are welded to their cell phones. They can't help it but talk on it. So you can – finding a way to listen into cell phones is one of the, the big tasks for intelligence agencies now. And the Chinese apparently decided that uh, they needed to use a balloon. So, Jim, let's go back to your research into Chinese spy culture. You mentioned they've been doing this for aggressively for the last 25 years. What are you learning as you're studying this? 
you know, the Chinese have been using espionage for business and national security advantage since they opened to the West. There's a couple differences, its trajectory, its aggressiveness, uh, its resources. One thing that Xi Jinping did when he took office was he inherited a sprawling espionage enterprise. That sometimes PLA cyber units, sometimes they went after government targets, sometimes they went after commercial targets to make money. They were helping a friend and they got a car in exchange. And Xi Jinping put all that in order. There's a process called tasking where you tell your assets, this is what I want you to collect. Xi Jinping created a new tasking process. Xi Jinping said, you will collect what I want, right? Not what makes you money. A shock for the PLA, part of the reason we see sometimes an increase in the profile of the Ministry of State Security. But the Chinese have always spied. Their foreign policy changed. So you could reasonably believe before 2012 that there was a chance that China would become a member of the international community, follow international norms and rules. They say they do, by the way. So is there any Chinese listening? I apologize for casting asparagus on your, uh, your assertions. But that hope that they would become more like any other country was quashed with Xi Jinping's arrival who decided for a variety of reasons, and of course, Jude Blanchett here knows them very well, variety of reasons that China's time had come, that it was time for China to move back to the center of the world stage. And they've become increasingly aggressive as a result. They even have, they even have police stations in other countries. That's amazing. Nobody else does that, right? They have kidnap teams in the US, at least one that we know because we caught them. What the Chinese would say is, hey, this is just like rendition. You guys did rendition. Now we're doing our own. This is rendition in, with Chinese characteristics. How do they have police stations in other countries? What, what countries? The Netherlands is a good example. There are a couple others. But a police agency opens an office in the, the country. And they used to have signs. They've taken them down because it's embarrassing. It says like uh, Fujian regional police agency. And they say, oh, it's just here to help citizens. They can come in and get their passports renewed. So a much more aggressive campaign. Some of it was their decision that, which they still believe, they are going to be the winners in this contest. They don't have to play by our rules because five years from now, our rules won't be that important. So that's the shift is defeat of the internationalist in China, arrival of Xi Jinping, and the decision that China's time had come. And so if you believe all that, why not spy? What's going to happen? And it's a fair point. They really haven't been penalized. Balloons are nothing compared to other stuff they've done, and they've never been penalized. So they're really flexing their muscles now. Yeah, and they have been for a while. The extraterritorial reach of Chinese espionage has increased markedly in the last five years. Again, they'll point to things like what we did in the War on Terror, They'll point to Snowden. They have a self-justifying narrative. The difference is, you know, nobody flees to China, <laughs> right? And so it's espionage tools that maybe we developed, but in service of a dictatorship. And they're also surveilling their own people. That's the start of this, is that it began in, in ye olden days. There was a watcher on every block or in every village, more than one. And so they had agents, the East... Germans did the same thing. It was a normal communist technique. You have somebody on the block who reports on what everyone's doing. It's so much easier to collect their internet traffic, their cell phone traffic, their phone communications. And the Chinese created, starting 20 years ago, immense national surveillance systems. That's one reason why I believe the Chinese are so aggressive in uh, espionage is that their own national practice is mass surveillance of everyone they can lay their hands on. Why wouldn't they do it other places as the capabilities become available? Are they teaching other countries how to do this? I don't worry so much about that because other countries don't have the money of the Chinese. But one thing to watch is uh, Huawei smart cities, right? So a smart city is basically a wired city. It has cameras, it has uh, collection devices. The alleged goal is to manage the city better. It is management in a way because you are seeing what people are doing. The downside for these countries, and I assume they know it, is you're collecting on your own citizens. That's probably bad and you should stop. But the Chinese are collecting on, on them as well. And so you are allowing them to ins 
all the surveillance infrastructure in Hungary, for example, that informs both the Hungarian government and the Chinese government. Probably a bad idea. So what keeps them from installing surveillance here in the United States? Well, they've had trouble. And, you know, we were uh, mean to Huawei a few years ago, deservedly so. We've started getting people to uninstall Chinese equipment. Like, China's the leading manufacturer of uh, the video cameras you see in stores or at uh, the hilarious one I thought for me was PXs, right? So you've got, you have Chinese video cameras connected to the internet. In and, military stores. Yeah. Uh, and, and everywhere else too. And also in the UK. And so China has, I'm not sure it was intentional, but they've certainly taken advantage of it. They have, for commercial reasons, sought to dominate certain markets, video cameras, commercial drones, telecom infrastructure. And somebody decided, hey, we can wire all this together and have a massive global surveillance system that the other guys will pay for. It is brilliant in a way. You know, they're getting, they're getting their customers to pay for their intelligence system. Cool. So let's get to the other side of this, which is us. What are we doing to combat this? And, you know, secondly, I want to ask you about our collection actions and capabilities. And, you know, are we using balloons, for instance? No, we don't use balloons. One thing that I think is funny is if we say, you know, there's a vigorous debate in the United States and the Chinese are confused by that. And so sometimes there's people in DOD who say we should be using balloons. The Chinese read it and assume it's gospel. And so they create balloons. We use something called aerostats, which are fixed balloons. They're tethered to the ground. Solves a lot of problems. It gives you a increased collection. So if I wanted to pick up, say, the cell phone signals in Washington, D.C., I could put an aerostat over the city tethered to the ground, and it would pick up some radius, you know, some number of miles, that all the signals there. We use aerostats on the border. We use them in the Afghanistan. But they're not free-floating balloons, right? We don't use free-floating balloons because we have satellites and we have airplanes. The great technological breakthroughs of the 1950s which gives you a hint about the Chinese. So we don't use them. We have better stuff. So we can do with our satellites and our airplanes what they can't. The U.S. has put a lot of effort into what they call space reconnaissance. And we have the National Reconnaissance Office uh, that builds satellites with what they call exquisite capabilities. And they've been doing this for decades. So it's fair to assume that we're ahead of the Chinese. How much ahead, uh, what we can do, not clear, right? But that's one of the reasons we don't need to. We, we used to fly airplanes over China. We even flew drones in the 1960s. So desperate to collect from a denied area. People will use anything. I assume that's why the Chinese use balloons. Frankly, if it had been me, I just would have sent a guy with a camper to go drive around the missile base in Montana, right? Uh, <laughs> cheaper and probably better collection but they, you know, somebody sold Xi Jinping on the idea of a balloon, and so there you go. But it's a way to loft a uh, signals intelligence payload over a denied area, and that's presumably what the Chinese are doing. Eventually, they'll move to satellites because it's just better, but they're not there yet. So what are we doing to basically combat their activities? We are not doing enough, and that has been one of the biggest problems. As I said, until 2015, we were asleep at the switch. Or we weren't. We knew it was going on, but we accepted the trade, right? They give us money. We let them spy. In 2015 with OPM, there was a realization maybe they'd gone a little too far. And so the U.S. is trying to, trying to find ways to deal with it. The FBI has a big program. One of the problems for it is it can look like it's racist, right? Because the Chinese, oddly enough, Xi Jinping thought is not that attractive for recruiting agents. Money and sex are, those work great, but most Chinese agents are Chinese nationals. That's not to say that Chinese nationals are all agents. That's insane. But the Chinese are more successful at recruiting human talent from uh, their own, in part because they can squeeze them. They can say, work with us here, you're in the US, work with us, or the pliers go on grandma's nose back home, right? But we don't have enough FBI agents you know our weaknesses in cybersecurity. We have trouble collecting in China because it's such a surveilled society. And they're paranoid. That's another part of their culture, their intelligence culture. Some of the trade measures you've seen have been an effort to uh, combat 
Chinese illicit acquisition of technology, so export controls, sanctions, entities list. All these things are good steps, but we have trouble dealing with the scope of the Chinese espionage program because they're not taking the hint. They don't look like they're going to take a hint, and there's no press. We Look, we did all this stuff that's in the playbook. Close consulates, arrest people, throw people out. It's not working, so we're going to have to do more. So what is it that they're so paranoid about? Well, if you were an unpopular dictatorship, you would naturally be paranoid. They've been paranoid since the founding of the Communist Party. Lenin was paranoid, right? Because Lenin knew if there was a popular vote, he would not win, right? And that means the biggest intelligence target for the Chinese government is their own population. But we're number two. I guess that makes people feel good. They're worried about the U.S. They have a strong ideology that says the U.S. is intent on maintaining world domination. And so therefore, we will do anything we can to hamper China and to hurt them and to build our own power, retain our own power. So it's a, it's a strange worldview. And remember, I'm not talking about all Chinese. I'm talking about Chinese in the intelligence community. That was one of the big shocks for me when I used to talk to these people is I thought, ah, oh, these guys, they get to read the Times, they get to read, you know, the Western press. Some of them lived in New York where they operated out of the UN. They know the reality. And the answer is no. People in the PLA and MSS intelligence services and probably the MPS believe this. And the party certainly believes that. So what, what else do you need for a massive and aggressive espionage campaign? So, Jim, just I want to go back to RFBI and trying and countermeasures. You said that you know it, it, it could walk up to the line of surveilling our own people. Oh no, no, we're coming up to a crisis in uh, domestic security because the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act will need to be renewed, particularly Section Seven Hundred Two, which allows for some collection. The Europeans are worried about it. The Republicans are worried about it. The Democrats are worried about it. There's a chance we could see a reduction in our collection capabilities at just the moment where that would be a really bad idea. There could be solutions. And so lawyers are standing on top of lawyers to come up with guidelines and rule books and principles, and maybe it'll work, but we would not spy on our own people. The FBI under Bill Barr, and you might remember we had Bill Barr here to not launch the kickoff of their China initiative, very keenly attuned to not making it seem like it was anti-Chinese. We had Director Ray here to talk about it. We had John Demers, who was the attorney, the assistant attorney general in charge of counterintelligence. They all came and said, we're kicking off a big campaign to push back on the Chinese. This administration has done a good job in continuing that, but it's not yet at the scale of what the Chinese are doing to us. So better cybersecurity, more FBI agents, continued ability to collect on Chinese intelligence activities in the United States. And that means more money, more people. So as you're studying all this and researching all this, do you have any conclusions yet or notions of what our policies should be? This administration has done a, a pretty good job of pushing back. And a lot of the measures they've taken to restrict Technology. Pushing back against Chinese. Yeah, pushing back against Chinese illicit collection of American technology. They've done a good job. A lot of their trade measures, export controls, other sanctions have really hurt the Chinese ability to collect using those means. They have not hurt the Chinese other collection programs, and that's what we need to focus on. It's harder because it's Chinese agents, Chinese hacking and it's probably China and space, including the occasional random balloon. Jim Lewis, thank you very much for helping us understand some of these issues a lot better. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 